My name is Simon de Graaf and over the course of the next 20 minutes I want to give you a little bit of an introduction into reproductive hormones and how they affect or really underpin all reproduction in the U. To begin with, I think it's worth just defining what a hormone is. Now, the textbook definition is written there on the screen and you can read that whilst I'm talking through uh, the diagram that you can also see. So for me, a hormone is some kind of a, a molecule which is produced somewhere that ends up being transported somewhere else by the blood and it has an impact on another part of the body. That's a, a fairly rough definition for, for what that is. Now, in the context of reproduction, we often talk about hormones which are produced in the pituitary, that's where a lot of the really important hormones are made, or perhaps in the, the gonads, so the testes or the, uh, or the ovary. And those hormones are then going to other parts of the body and having an effect there. Now you can see here in this diagram that we've got um, blood flow coming in and you've got that blood running around cells of the endocrine gland. So that's the, the gland, which is the source of the hormone. And then you've got that hormone traveling to somewhere else to where this target tissue is. And here's an important point. You see this little orange things here. They are the receptors for that hormone in that particular target tissue. Now that hormone will only work on that target tissue if there are receptors there for the hormone. If there are no receptors or there's the wrong type of receptor on that particular target tissue, then the hormone won't have an effect. So that's just a quick introduction to what a hormone is and, and how they get around. When we talk about reproductive hormones, they are tons. And you can see just some of them that are up here on the screen. I thought that it could be valuable for you to, to know some of the basic divisions or how reproductive hormones are separated. So to begin with, uh, the peptide hormones and the two important ones here, or really the, the main important one that you need to know about for the rest of this presentation is GnRH or gonadotrophin releasing hormone. And what that is, is just a series of, of peptides all strung together and that makes this particular hormone GnRH, which impacts upon another structure in the, uh, in the animal's body, uh, the pituitary, and we'll, uh, we'll go through that in a second. Now the next um, type of hormones which we will discuss are these polypeptide dimers. Now these are things like um, FSH or follicle stimulating hormone, uh, equine chorionic gonadotrophin, another name for that, or the old name for that was PMSG or pregnant mare serum gonadotrophin. Inhibin is a polypeptide dimer and uh, the more recently uh, known about activin, which is sort of its, its opposite. Now what these are, are two um, chains of, of peptides and what these um, peptides do, these long peptides do, is actually link up together or sort of are associated together in a particular pattern and what that does is give them a, a certain type of effect. So there's usually an alpha unit and a beta unit and they are related together and that gives them their, uh, their effect. Now the next type of hormones are the lipid hormones and one of the subsections here we're going to call the steroid hormones and these are the ones that I think most people think about when they think of reproductive hormones so this is your estrogens your progester progestogens your testosterone all of those sorts of things um, something you might not be aware of is that all of these are synth synthesized from cholesterol so there are various enzymes which change cholesterol into progesterone and then can be changed into testosterone and something you quite possibly aren't aware of is that estrogen is produced from testosterone. Now the last one that I will briefly talk about are also lipid hormones, they're the prostaglandins and you can see here that what these are are a bunch of um, uh, fatty acids which are uh, 
brought together and they have a, a different type of function to the, uh, the other st steroid hormones that are, fall under this lipid hormone uh, umbrella. Now, the entire control of reproduction is under hormone influence. And the important structures which are there are the hypothalamus, which is part of the brain, and the pituitary, which is a little kind of dangly bit which uh, hangs off underneath the brain. Now, there's a, a really important and um, very uh, ornate or detailed blood flow which is associated between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And the, the fancy name for that is the hypothalamo hypophyseal portal system. And what that is, is it's a really a, a network of, of blood flow, which takes um, hormones, well, the GnRH, which is produced in the hypothalamus, and it runs it down there into the pituitary. So that very, very small changes in the levels of GnRH are detected by that, uh, by that pituitary. And this is an overall picture of what that axis looks like um, that we talk about controls reproduction. So we refer to it as the HPG axis, and we do that because always saying hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis is quite difficult. But what you see here is similar to what you saw on the previous screen in which we have the hypothalamus and the pituitary, but then we have down the bottom the gonad. So in the female, the gonad is the ovary, and the ovary is where we have follicles being produced and corporal lattea being produced after follicles are ovulating. And you can see here the overall picture of how different hormones are linked up. So essentially we have GnRH released from the hypothalamus, we have that acting on the pituitary to produce hormones like LH, which is luteinizing hormone, FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone. And under the influence of those two hormones, you have the ovary producing estrogen and inhibin. Now, inhibin can negatively feed back on the pituitary, specifically for FSH, so that is a little feedback mechanism to control the amount of FSH which is being produced. And then for the estrogen that, that is produced, it can either have a negative feedback effect for something we refer to as the, the tonic center, so that's for most of the cycle, or at a certain part of the reproductive cycle, it can actually have positive feedback. So this is during a part of the follicular phase of the cycle, and this positive feedback causes a very big increase in the amount of LH, well, the amount of GnRH, and as a result, the amount of LH which is produced and causes the follicle to ovulate. But more about that later. Now here we have a graph, or what you're about to see is a graph, of the Easter cycle of a sheep. Now it's taken from a, an American book, so some of the spellings are, are a little bit different. Um, and the, the way that it breaks up the cycle is a little bit different to how we would normally teach it here in Australia. But the important things I want you to see are that there is something called the follicular phase, and this is where we have a follicle on the, on the ovary. We always say that in reproduction that we are, we're not very good at naming things. We tend to be very obvious about our naming, our naming conventions. So we have things like the follicular phase being when a follicle is present. We have progesterone for pregnancy being the name for the, uh, the hormone which is responsible for maintaining pregnancy. Estrus is when estrogen is in very high amounts uh, and that sort of thing. You'll, uh, you'll see that pop up quite frequently as we, we go through some of our talks. So the first hormone that I want to show you here is progesterone. Now progesterone is produced from the corpus luteum and that's the structure that is produced after ovulation. Um, but when the corpus luteum is in full function, you get high levels of progesterone and that progesterone does something called negative feedback, which we touched on in the previous slide and prevents ovulation from occurring or much follicular growth from occurring. FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, another very obviously named um, hormone. This is the hormone which 
stimulates follicular growth. So this is uh, a hormone which is acting under the influence of the amount of GnRH which is being produced from the hypothalamus and this will help grow the follicles which will eventually become dominant and um, cause a, an egg to be released. Oestrogen is responsible for oestrus, so you can imagine that when oestrogen levels are, are very, very high, you are, are getting the standard oestrus behavioural response. And oestrogen is something which is produced by the follicle. So you can see that as the follicle would be growing, you're getting more and more oestrogen being produced. Here is when ovulation occurs, so when the follicle ruptures, the egg is released, there's no more follicle for it to be producing estrogen, so that plummets down back to zero or near zero. And LH is this other hormone which is being produced by the pituitary, and again, you would have heard me just mention before that as LH climbs under the influence of this positive feedback of, of estrogen on the surge center in the hypothalamus, it gets to this really high level and it causes luteinization of the follicle and that luteinization is what causes the follicle to rupture and the ovulation to occur. So when it's very high, uh, it's just before ovulation, the ovulation happens and then it will plummet back down to zero again. Now here's a, a bit more of a detailed picture of what happens to the follicle itself during the estrus cycle. So here we have um, our progesterone levels, just as a reminder. And here we would have uh, our follicular phase starting, because that's follicles will start um, growing, and this rest of it would be what we would refer to as a uh, luteal phase when the corpus luteum is at, uh, uh, growing and functioning. So when there's a lot of progesterone, what happens within the follicular pool is that you do get some selection of follicles and they might even become dominant, but they undergo atresia because you have this high level of progesterone present. There's this negative feedback on the reproductive axis and prevents there from being um, large amounts of, uh, of um, estrogen being, uh, being produced. When the progesterone is diminished after luteolysis occurs, and this is actually something which happens when prostaglandin F2 alpha is released, you don't have this strong negative feedback on the HPG axis so that you have these selected follicles able to become dominant, very, very large, and then able to ovulate. So they don't undergo that atresia. Now, there are a couple of these which occur in every reproductive cycle. These are referred to as follicular waves. So those are the follicles, but what about the corpus luteum? So Again, this is a sheep and down the bottom we have days of the cycle and up the side we have the amount of progesterone which is being produced. And you can see that as around here is when um, you would have estrus and, and ovulation happening around you know, sort of day zero, day one, etc. And after that ovulation has occurred, the follicle is rupturing. Well, the follicle ruptures and ovulation happens at that, that specific point. But that follicle turns into a corpus luteum. And as the corpus luteum forms and gains function, it produces more and more progesterone. And then if there is no pregnancy, if there's no implantation of an embryo, then there is a signal for the corpus luteum to be destroyed. So this is luteolysis, lysis of the luteal tissue. And uh, that, again, that's prostaglandin F2 alpha. And when that CL, that's what we refer to them as usually, CLs when they're destroyed, they obviously reduce the amount of progesterone which is being made, so it will plummet there. So here's some pictures of what the uh, seals look like as they are forming. So this is the early part of their of their life. See them becoming somewhat larger here. 
And then when they're going at full tilt there, quite a substantial structure on the ovary. And they start to become paler as they are lysed. So this is just another way of looking at the entire reproductive axis. We have our place in the hypothalamus where GnRH is produced. Sometimes we call that the GnRH pulse generator. And those that GnRH a pulse generator is, is making gonadotrophin releasing hormone and that acts upon the anterior pituitary to produce gonadotrophins. So these are trophins are the things that grow something and a trophin of the gonads makes the, the gonad grow or increase in function. So the LH and the FSH are the gonadotrophins produced by the anterior pituitary and these in the female are acting on the ovary. So in the follicular phase we have a follicle which is what you can see there. It's an excised follicle from an ovary. These follicles make estrogen as we mentioned before. They also make inhibin which is feeding back on FSH to keep those levels uh, down a little bit so there's not too many more follicles which are made once one of these becomes dominant. Overall these are providing negative feedback to the GnRH pulse generator. But when we get to the pre-ovulatory period, so just before ovulation happens, you've got a very very large follicle which is producing lots of estrogen and when there's lots of estrogen you have positive feedback rather than negative feedback. So this causes GnRH levels to really increase for the pulses to become very very rapid and then as a result you get this LH surge and the LH surge is what causes ovulation as we discussed before. Now we move to the luteal phase so our follicle is turning into a CL. The CL is making progesterone. The progesterone causes very large amounts of negative feedback on this axis. It reduces the, the pulsatility of the GnRH pulse generator, which diminishes the amount of FSH and LH being produced. And that damps everything down. Now, of course, these phases are cyclical. So if we look over the, the course of, a, of time, we can see our follicular phase here with the estradiol levels. Estradiol is just a type of estrogen. So estradiol levels increasing, LH increasing at a certain point, ovulation occurring, then we get our corpus luteum forming, so progesterone levels rise, which is this red line. If there's no implantation of an embryo, we've got prostaglandin acting on the CL causing progesterone levels to fall. Got uh, our little bumps of estrogen happen as we have waves of follicular development, but it's only when the CL is destroyed that we get another big bump of estrogen and LH ovulation and the cycle continues and continues until the animal gets pregnant or it becomes the non-breeding season. These are just a couple of windows into the different parts of the cycle just to remind you of some of these earlier points that I was making that at specific points in the cycle FSH and LH levels are uh, at well different levels so during the luteal phase these hormones are going to be low because there's not much pulsatility of the GnRH pulse generator the early parts of the follicular phase they're going to be a bit higher and then just prior to ovulation when you have this pre-ovulatory surge of LH due to positive feedback of estrogen on that surge center in the hypothalamus that's when uh, these are, are very very high. So the key points here are that the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis controls reproduction in ewes as well as rams but uh, for this particular talk we're focusing on the female and it's really key for you to know that 
if this axis is not active, so if there are, is no production of GnRH, if there's no production of the gonadotrophins, then there's going to be no cyclicity. So the ovary will not be operational. There will be no ovulations. And if there are no ovulations, then there can be no reproduction.